Welcome to the Intersecting Us podcast, where math and life intersect. In this week's podcast, Brian and Dave discuss math and morality, bridging the gap between numbers and justice. It seems like every culture that uh, you study or you live in or you experience if you go on travels realizes what justice is. And I guess maybe a better way to put it, we, we definitely seem to know when injustice is done. Today on the on the podcast, we're going to talk about that word justice. Again, this is one of the chapter names in uh, Francis Sue's book, Mathematics for Human Flourishing. And as I read through this, like again, uh, we keep saying this, uh, Dave, we keep saying how good these are, and they are. They're just, they resonate, I think, with us because they've got a math and life feel to them. But I think they'd resonate with anybody who wanted to read that book and, and interact with it. But the thing that he started with and I thought was was really cool, he's a Chinese-American, and he was talking about going into a Chinese restaurant that he liked and how the treatment or what he was offered was different if he went in there as someone with someone who's in more of a, a you know, non-Chinese descent versus a couple people who went in to, that were Chinese and maybe even spoke Chinese. Do you remember that in the book? And, and did that resonate with you, Dave? Yeah, it did. And I must admit, kind of like you, Brian, it's, this uh, book is really helpful. And and I must admit, when I sometimes I read these chapters, it's like, okay, this this one's on justice. Uh, my first reaction is like, I don't have too much to say about this uh, because it doesn't seem like justice and math kind of like go together. But one thing this book does for me is it encourages me to take time to reflect on my own life. And so I, I did that. I, I reflected on my life. And, and so I started thinking, it's like, okay, like right now I'm working at coaching actuaries and we have people uh, from China. We have people from Malaysia. We've got people really from all over the place and there's a diverse culture. I don't really think about it because I don't think about those people like that they're Malaysians or Chinese or I think of them as, you know, John and Baron, you know, that's what I think of them. But when I take a step back, it's like I realize, okay, there, there is like a lot of diversity here. And I've really enjoyed the opportunity to provide justice. And, and then I look back on the, uh, kind of like the career of, uh, the business. And I remember the first actuary I hired was from Africa, Nana, Nana from Ghana. And, uh, he was an amazing guy to hire. And he was such a joy. He was an intern and, and our first and first employee was Ganesh from India. And I, I just met with him yesterday and he lived with us. We went to India to uh, attend his wedding. And so as I started thinking about it, uh, you know, there's just story after story I could think of about people I care about from a very diverse background, but they've become so much part of my life. I really don't even think of them other than who they, you know, who they are. But this chapter kind of encouraged me to take a step back and realize maybe a bigger picture of what's going on. Yeah, and I think the way he the, and he does that in most of the chapters, he kind of has kind of an overreaching story that kind of points back to. And, you know, he talked about as a Chinese American, he doesn't speak Chinese and he'd go into this restaurant he really liked and he would get a menu. And, and I, I can't remember exactly. And I should have written it down, but I know like the dessert he'd get was Jello. You know, yeah. which is very American, you know, in some ways. But he said, if a couple guys came in or, or or gals came in that spoke Chinese, they got a different menu, and they didn't get jello. They got more Chinese, you know, nor, nor traditional Chinese. And his whole idea was was the, they would say, well, you don't need that menu because you're mm -hmm. not, you know, you're not going to like it because you you're not really Chinese. And that his whole metaphor was there, the idea that within justice, a lot of times we don't even know we're doing it. He wasn't saying these this restaurant was being, you know, untoward or being mean or anything. It was just what he would call an implicit bias that, well, no, you're American. You don't want this traditional Chinese. You don't usually like that. And so you don't even, that menu is not for you. And that's kind of his overreading, overreaching uh, idea there is. When we get into, and he does a lot of good in some stories with some actual people, um, the one uh, young woman that didn't get very much help and was seeing that she couldn't do math because she's a woman, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, didn't get, but it was an implicit bias that a lot of these people didn't even know they were doing. And then mm -hmm. and it was, it was an injustice being done. She mm -hmm. wasn't being treated like other people. 
right. which was kind of what the whole chapter's about, really. Right. Yeah, I was reminded that this weekend I was visiting with a friend of mine, Felix, and Felix is just turned 18. He attends uh, Des Moines Roosevelt here in Des Moines, and he, uh, he was saying he's an African-American uh, gentleman, and he was just telling me that, you know, every week he deals with being treated differently and uh, kind of like what that is like. And I appreciated him being honest with me, telling his story about how uh, being a minority here in the um, U.S. is really like. And, and so that was, you know, a good reminder for me. And one of the things I've becoming more aware of, I think, these last couple of years, first of all, is, you know, I, you and I are both really from what people would call the privileged class. Um, yeah. we're, we're white. Um, you can't see that everybody, but we are, <laughs> we are male. You could probably hear that. Uh, we are American. Uh, we happen to be in our fifties and, you know, we're just people, but from a society perspective, the category that sometimes we are put into is, is one of a highly privileged and, and, you know, that really has nothing to do with our abilities or what we've, you know, what we've accomplished. It's just we happen to, you know, we were born an American citizen when we first came into this world. And and sometimes I really don't understand how many people come into life with a very different perspective from that. And I'm starting to appreciate more about how they may view me and, you know, some of the differences that they may perceive in, uh, you know, different statuses. And even though you and I don't necessarily think that, uh, that's who we are, but I could see where there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, differences where they would see in us. And, you know, I recognize that, you know, in this 30 minutes, this topic is so huge and it is so big and it needs so much attention. We, we will not be able to do it any justice, kind of pun intended, but because this, this, this problem is huge. So I just want to acknowledge that we're, that this is a big problem. Maybe we can scratch the surface a little bit, but you and I really have a big heart about how important this is and our desire that we would all feel like we are kind of like part of the human race and we're all equally valued. And I do think that's the key. The, you know, we've talked about that before that different worldviews have different ideas of, you know, what's the intrinsic value of a human. And I think uh, it's implied uh, in, in a lot of, of his chapters. It's, it's a little bit more uh, explicit here because he, he did get into the idea of, uh, he said that, you know, that uh, I'll just re quote him, you know, some religious traditions, including mine, and that would be Francis's uh, advocate caring for orphans, widows, immigrants, and the poor. And I think, and then he did a really good turn to move that into math. Um, cause a lot of this chapter is about people not be being given an opportunity, a just opportunity to use their, in this case, mathematical abilities because of, uh, whether it's race or gender or, or something like that. He said, I see these categories in the mathematical community as well. You know, people who don't have an advocate, nobody to mm -hmm. say, Hey, you can do it that within the family and the, you know, and, mm -hmm. and those who are new to mathematics, maybe they didn't have a high school that you got to take Calc three before you got to, mm -hmm. you know, to university and, and those with no resources, you know, those mm -hmm. are, you know, he used those as kind of the same categories that they're powerless in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And his whole idea was kind of a call to arms to people reading it who have some power, which we would both be probably on that in a sense that we have, Empower may be the wrong word, but opportunity to help people. Mm -hmm. um, right. You should do it. You know, you mm -hmm. should do it. You should do it the well you can. And 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 the way he he did it, I thought was so cool. Um, there's so many different ways to define justice, and the way he did it was by using two types of justice. The first mm -hmm. one he called primary justice. When I love the way it involves right relationships, and that's all. That's what we. But you know, intersecting us. That's what we're about. Life and math. You know, again, we can do math. We can do life. But if we don't do it together, why bother? You know. But treating each person with dignity, care, and establishing social practices and institutions that support these aspects. You know, that's that's primary. And then he got into what he called rectifying justice, 
which is spotting something wrong and trying to make it right. And then this line, and I'll let you kind of talk to this, Dave. This line was so cool. He said, if primary justice, you know, teaching each person has dignity and, and, and treating them with care were commonplace, rectifying justice would not be needed. (laughs) <laughs> I thought that was really good. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to hit is the primary part, you know. It is. Yeah. And I know that people, let's say, that are in the public school system, they're dealing with uh, have to be reactionary because people within their school perhaps feel like there's injustice. And so they have to deal with it. And you and I were sitting here intersecting us. Uh, we, we have no employees. And we can maybe talk ideally about the primary justice and that that gives us freedom to to do that. And it's much easier, a much better culture to be talking about justice when we're not trying to solve differences between two individuals. And so I do like how we put that together. And I think that that is something that helps us to, you know, just put language around things because it's like, okay, we can talk about the ideal, but then now we've got this problem we're, we're working with. And, and, um, uh, just to give context or maybe make this, uh, real, uh, Brian, you know that, uh, I've been going through a process the last few months of being involved with, um, a mission to help, uh, the inner city of Des Moines basically flourish, come alongside and helping them. And that was something that was kind of in the primary justice phase when we were working with it. And and then as we got deep into it, uh, then it kind of uh, the the second type of justice, the rectifying justice started to kick in. And and that was really hard to to wrestle with. And uh, my wife and I, we, we struggled with that because we were, you know, working with people we care about. And now we're trying to work through you know, whether it be actual injustice or perceived injustice, but that part was much messier and, and it wasn't very fun. Yeah, I bet not. And, and I think again, it's, it's, and when he gets into this stuff, it's, it's easy to kind of look on the outside and say, yeah, it's a good idea. It's a little mm-hmm. different when you're, it, when you're right in the middle of it. That makes right. it a lot harder because, you know, now it's real. And, and, and again, the primary justice is an ideal where the rectifying justice is essentially an action where you're spotting something and then you're trying to make it right because you believe that each person has dignity and care. And I think where I see, and this is, this, it could be a rabbit trail, so we don't go down very far, but just to put it out there, what I can sometimes see is what we tend to do is sometimes the pendulum will, drive, will go too far the other way. Um, uh-huh. I don't think we need to talk about that too much right now because I think we need to, right now we realize that there are some implicit biases in, in math that he's talked about empowering people and looking and letting people use their gifts and talents, regardless of, you know, what they look like or how they talk. But, but what you can happen is you, you almost think, well, if somebody's different than me, then they're really good. You know, it's like, well, I think justice would show that and dignity would show that, you know, maybe they have some problems and we have some problems and that's the relational thing. You mm-hmm. don't know that unless you know them. And mm-hmm. that's the problem we get into. We, we, we categorize people. It's like, well, those people over there, they don't have the power. Mm-hmm. So we need to give them justice. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that can be about as bad of a problem as not realizing that they need it. You know, again, I know this is very hard, but you can't really do much unless you just do it. It's all not always one on one, but if you've got to know the person. Right. That's key. And every example he gave, it was personal. Right. Once right. you know the person, then oh my golly, don't you want to give you want them to have to, to, to give them dignity, you want to care for them because you built a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And even though, like you said, you want to be, quote, colorblind or whatever they want to use and not. But you also have to recognize that they may be having to deal with some things that you don't or you may have to deal with things that they don't. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But you don't get yeah. that unless you ask them the question. What do you think? Right. You know, you're you're right. you know, that's where we get into trouble, I think. Right. And that whole idea of the pendulum going too far, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, is we want to make things like fair. We don't want to enable someone by lowering the bar for one person and and having the bar higher for the other. And that's one of the things I think that, for example, we we see in the actuarial exams. Um, and that's you know a topic we talk a lot about because that's where we come from. 
is that in the actual exams, the graders, uh, whether it be people or computers, they do not know who the people are that, you know, wrote the exams. Uh, their personal identity is private and it's not revealed. And so uh, there's really no way that there could be any biasness in there unless perhaps if you have an essay and you start maybe making conjectures about their handwriting or something, but that's stretching it a bit. But the, the bottom line is that the actuarial community tries to provide justice in how people become actuaries and making it fair for everyone. And I know that that's what the school system tries to do. It's more difficult there because, the, you know, the professors know the people and, and there is personal um, knowledge there. But in the actuarial field, for those exams, you know, it, it gets closer to the ideal justice that I think we're all striving for. Yeah. And, I, and it, it is it's really all of his chapters do this a lot, which is why we like the book, I suppose, so much is, you know, dealing with kind of the math world, but yet also dealing with the life world along with it. I think that's the cool part because that, that kind of hits our hits where we want to be. But I do think when, when you looked at this, you know, I think again, you know, in, in life we have, I do think it's very good to have goals. We realize in a, in, in an imperfect world that we're in that sometimes the goal of everybody being traded fairly and just maybe we can say, well, that's, we can never meet that because, you know, you've got people who don't want to do that. You've got evil people. You've got uh, people who are apathetic, uh, you know, or whatever, or self-centered or all that. So they don't want it. Well, that's true. I, I realize all that, but that doesn't mean we can't have a goal that way. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the goal. And I do think in some of our current political and ideologically and philosophical uh, American culture, it's almost like we're to the point where it's just all about, it can become, it's about power structures. And, and I realize that's part of it. I'm not saying that's not part of it. But the goal should not be that we get, this group gets more power and this group gets less, although it may be part of the solution. The goal should be that everybody's treated with dignity and everybody's mm -hmm. caring about their fellow person for, because they're intrinsically worthy. And if that right. means we need to change some structure, sure, let's do it. But not that goal should not be to just balance power and equal out mm -hmm. stuff. It, it should be everybody should be treated with dignity and given an opportunity. And and I know that's not in here, <laughs> but it comes to mind. Everybody, if you're truly trying to show dignity, everybody should be be we should be able within the right parameters to forgive people if they don't mm -hmm. do it right. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's the big thing in justice, yeah. because sometimes, you know, and, and I'm sure Francis would say this um, and, and uh, that sometimes, you know, justice has to be trumped with a little bit of mercy. Um, mm -hmm. And, and right. you have to be careful with that, you know, given the fact that this Chris that he uh, is, is corresponding with, with it's in prison. Mm -hmm. You would understand mercy and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the thing. Again, does it mean. You might not have to pay your debt to society or, or you may not have to have some consequences of a bad action. But, you know, we always have to think about, OK, now this is still a person that's messed up, a person that's had some bad choices. Is there still mercy? Is there still forgiveness there? Because without that, you don't you're not going to have a relationship with them. Right. I appreciate that. I certainly need a lot of that grace and mercy in, in my life for people that that uh, hang around with me. And I think we all appreciate that. And, you know, I think taking maybe a, another turn on this to topic is that if it's hard for you to or if it's difficult for you to kind of see where math and justice kind of can flourish together, I would encourage you to take a look at the history of math. And maybe you've done that already, but take a look at it within the lens of this topic of justice. And so rather than thinking about, well, you've got the Greeks, you've got the Egyptians, you've got the Indians, uh, you've got the Europeans. Think about it in terms of how all of these different cultures and time periods and people contributed to the math that we have today. And when we experience the math we have, it's like a hodgepodge of cultures coming together. You know, I don't know what the equivalent analogy would be for some sort of soup, but what we're consuming in math today is a collection of pretty much every culture that's ever lived to some extent. 
and it all just kind of works. And I'm not aware of anything else in life where that concept is true. And so when we are studying math, we're really benefiting from the Greeks, from the Europeans, from the Chinese, from the Indians. And we don't even really know it until you go back and you study it. But we need to be, I think, grateful for that heritage that we have and that it is a beautiful thing that we can now experience. And it's really about justice in the big picture of how it arrived to us through time and culture. Well, and I think that does go back to, you know, what he's talking about with the primary justice, the idea that given we have all those different cultures and time periods and uh, that have put so much work into math. And you could, if you're listening to this and that's not your gig, you can put your own field in there, medicine or science or whatever. But, you know, his idea is because of the dignity and, and the care we should have for people in relationships is that we, you know, we shouldn't assume that certain people are not going to be good at math. You know, certain demographics of people. Um, it's got to, and he uses, I think he used that the metaphor, you know, you won't like the stuff on that menu. You know, you got to have the other menu. And it's like, and it's, well, how do you know? And, and he did get into the grades and how that's just a snapshot and that we shouldn't. And it's a whole idea. Uh, he's talking to teachers here. So if teachers are listening or anybody who has an ability to kind of mentor someone, let's go with trying to make them flourish. Hence the name of the book. And I think he even put it that there's no good reason to tell someone they shouldn't be doing math. Mm -hmm. Um because you just don't know from the measurables if that's just because they're measured at a point. Who knows what their potential is? Mm -hmm. You know, you might have the next, you know, the next Newton or, you know, or the next Euler sitting there, but they've never had an opportunity to try anything. And people think, well, they, they've messed up on one math or they did the dreaded. They, you know, they failed an actuarial exam. And so that, well, they're just not cut out for that. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, well, how, I don't know their background. I don't know that. You know, that's their mm -hmm. decision to stop, um, not mine. And I think mm -hmm. that's what he was getting at, that justice would be the whole idea behind it was because of the dignity in justice that let's try to go with at every kid. If you're doing a student or every person and let's try to get them to flourish and give them opportunity. Mm -hmm. And just because mm -hmm. they might get a C minus on an algebra two test doesn't mean they can't do differential calculus. They might be able to do it if we just encouraged them and gave mm -hmm. them some good tools and came alongside them. Back to that, you know, maybe they're an orphan, a widow, or a, or a foreigner, as it as the as that says, and and maybe if they had some had some advocates, had people that wanted to be part of a community and treated them with dignity, who knows what they might be able to do? Mm -hmm. I thought that was yeah. He did a really good job of that in this chapter. Yeah, and I think another word he brought in, if I remember correctly, I, I forget which chapter it was, but I'm pretty sure it was this chapter. But he talked about that it really came down to a matter of belonging. And I think that if you as a listener are struggling with belonging, I, you know, I don't feel like I have a place where I can belong. I think, uh, math is an opportunity for you to come alongside and be part of a bigger story that is rich in justice and flourishing. And it is an opportunity for you to grow and, and, you know, all these things that are in the book that we're talking about, I think it's an invitation for people to to join. And whether that means becoming a math major or simply just playing around and, and having fun with math, or maybe they're going to help some other person understand a math concept by tutoring. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of creative ways to be more actively involved with math. But I think if that's something that you're longing for, uh, that that sense of belonging, I think math is an opportunity to, to make that happen. Yeah, and I do think it, it's kind of the idea that he used the word, and he would qualify as this, we, we have, have this word in our culture, minority. You mm -hmm. hear that. And, and, and when I say that word, it almost sounds like it's a pejorative term. Mm -hmm. You know, that you're in the minority, you know, whether mm -hmm. you're in the voting minority or in the ethnic minority and the gender minority. Uh, height minority, whatever. But think about that's a mathematical term. Mm -hmm. It's just it less than 50%, really. That's or you're right. maybe not even that. You're less, there's groups that are bigger than you. Right. So it's what we call a quantitative 
It just tells you quantity. Right. You know, if, we, if you and I walked into a, a restaurant and there were 60% African American, 20% Chinese, and 20% uh, European white, we'd be in the minority. Right. And, and, just math, math. There's no, we can't argue about that because you can right. say, well, no, I want, you know, because we just are. But what he's talking about with justice here and with dignity and care, he's talking about, we call, you know, not quantitative, but qualitative. You know, uh-huh. what is the quality of a person does not depend on how many of you there are. Mm-hmm. You're helping to get somebody else. And uh, he didn't get into that, but I thought about that. You know, I, I read this on the Kindle and you can take notes. And so that's the note I put was that mm. this has to do with, we're talking about quality. We're assuming that everybody has intrinsic quality as a human. And no mm. matter what group you're in, you're, if you keep working at it, you, we're probably all in the minority in some demographic. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, like you said, you and I may be in a lot of ways seen as the majority. Um, mm-hmm. But again, that's it comes back to the whole what the chapter's hitting. I want to say what difference does it make? But he did. He did say you got to be careful with that because uh-huh. you, you you still have to be careful because it, it does make a difference. And, and there are these implicit biases that we have. And again, what our, what his goal seems like. And I think it's so great that he's a minority because because he probably gets listens to more, which I think is great. Good. Um, I think our culture is getting there. And I think that's wonderful. But he brings this out. It's like we need to see this because an implicit bias is a bias that you don't see. Mm. We want to make it explicit. Mm. Oh, I understand that this is a Hispanic woman in college. And I might just be thinking as a professor because of that, she's not good at math. Mm -hmm. When she may be, like I said, the next Euler or so, who knows, you know, Mm -hmm. give her an opportunity. Give her, Mm -hmm. come alongside, advocate for her. Don't, you know. That's when we want to see colorblind. We just got done with MLK Day, and I, I thought, you know, what, what his old quote, you know, uh, we should be judged. There's our word, justice, by the, you know, not the color of our skin, but the content of our character, you know. And, mm-hmm. and I think, but yeah, and I think uh, Martin Luther King Jr. understood that there was still implicit biases. It's just not mm-hmm. like I said that and everything's wonderful. But think, mm-hmm. what is he talking about there? He's not talking about quantity. He's talking about quality. And I mm-hmm. think that was good. So maybe we could use. I just came to me, but. Maybe we can use math to get that minority word and not call, you know, in our minds, we get that as a, sometimes it's a negative thing. It's like, no, mm-hmm. it's just a number. It just mm-hmm. happens to be a ratio and you just happen to be on the lower end of the ratio. So be it. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're a worse person. That's right. Own it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was, he did just such a good job of, of weaving some of his, those ideas in uh, those, those ideas of philosophy and, and even religion into the math part in this chapter. I was really impressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, my favorite story of being a minority, uh, I mentioned that I'd gone to India. My wife and I went there with Ganesh when he got married. And uh, that was, you know, quite the experience to uh, experience a Hindu wedding. He, he met his wife for the first time. You know, he was living in the States and oh, his wife yeah. was in India and they had an arranged marriage. And so talk about a cultural differences. We, uh, Julie and I, my wife, we, uh, uh, had a lot of different cultural experiences that were really cool. We love Indian food and, but we got to meet the people of India and it, it really was neat. But the, the one story I remember that was pretty funny was when we were on a train, we spent a lot of time in like Madras and so our Chennai and it, you know, it's a huge city. And but then the wedding was in this small village in southern India. So we were taking a train out there. And uh, often I would just go outside. You could go outside of the train and kind of look at the countryside. And as the train's going by, I would see a bunch of kids playing out in the field. And then they would see me. And these kids are probably, I don't know, seven or eight years old. And there would be like a bunch of them. And then one of them like saw me and he got all excited. He started pointing at me and then yelling, white man, white man. And then all the other people turned and looked. At, yeah, and then they all kind of said, white man, white man, and jumping up and down and we're all excited. <laughs> and I told Julie, like, they may not have ever seen a white person before. And I was the first one. And so that really felt like I was a minority there. But, uh, you know, when you see kids jumping it up and down, you you know that they're not saying anything mean or whatever they were actually no, excited no. Hey, this yeah. is like it's like a martian 
<laughs> and, for them to see it. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, that is, he, he hits, you know, he hit that in the, the idea that again, there's probably, and again, just because it's an implicit bias does not mean it's necessarily negative. <laughs> um, it's just, it's just, I guess the word that comes to mind is ignorance. You know, you just have it right. and ignorant just means you don't know. Right. It's, it's not evil. And they didn't mm. know what a white man looked like because they hadn't seen one yet. Yeah. But um, well, as we wrap up here, I think, you know, what he really got into toward the end was, you know, obviously he's a professor, so he's into the teaching idea. But that he just really encouraged people. And that's, of course, what we're doing, too, is try to encourage folks to if it's math, we're, we're saying math, you can take out math and put in your own discipline if you want there. But, you know. It, we should be motivated when we're studying this stuff and helping other people study it to rectify any injustice. People, you know, don't have any, uh, you know, we call them the orphan of mathematics. So they don't have anybody to advocate for them. Uh, if they don't have anybody to uh, be with them that, and have a community that, that we, we can do that. So I thought that that kind of sums up what he put in that chapter. But uh, Dave, why don't you kind of finish us up here with the last word? Well, okay. Well, uh, I just had a thought uh, as far as uh, an action item. I know we're, we're not really calling people to action, but there's an organization, a couple of organizations I'd like to put a plug out for. Uh, one of them is called Math Motivators, and I'm involved with it. Coaching Actuaries is, is involved with it. Basically, what it is, it's come alongside people who are in Algebra 1, and we're coming alongside and helping them. And in there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's an organization. And so if, if you're interested in tutoring people in Algebra 1, giving them more opportunities for justice, then I would encourage you to check out Math Motivators. It's, it's a good organization. Uh, and then another one, it's much smaller, but it's just something that I started, and that's a book club. And, you know, in the book club, we are really encouraging flourishing. And I think that, you know, there's no cost to it. So there's no cost of entry and there certainly are no barriers to who you are. And the main thing is we're looking for people who enjoy talking about math. So if you want to kind of uh, be part of a community that is uh, focused on these types of things, then you can just connect with me and I can give you more information. Yeah, thanks for that. And that does kind of that ends us up real well, because, you know, when you talked about community, that is part of what it means to do justice, because you can't really do it without having relationships with people. And again, you're going to be able to not that we're looking for injustice, but when somebody needs help or they're feeling like they're being treated in, in, in a bad way, that's a lot easier for them to, to come for help when they have somebody they trust in a community like that, whether it's uh, math motivators or or the book club. So we mm -hmm. would encourage you to get into that. So. Yeah, but justice is, is something that we all, again, as we started with, we know about and we know what we see in justice. But I think this, uh, Francis did such a good job of putting together the math part and showing how it can help us uh, see things in life uh, just a little bit better than if we, we don't pursue those things. been the Intersecting Us podcast. To further engage with Intersecting Us, go to intersectingus.com.